Hello, and welcome to season two of Wonderstruck. I'm your host, Elizabeth Revere. I'm a clinical psychologist, a yoga teacher, and a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. I'm really curious about our experiences of wonder and awe and how they transform us. My guest today is Mike Murphy, co-founder of Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. Esalen is remarkable in a number of ways, from the breathtaking land it inhabits to the ongoing beauty and rigor of its mission. Since opening in 1962, Esalen has served as an incubator for human potential. Guests come from all over the world to engage openly and meaningfully in their own transformation. Having visited last year, I started to wonder about Esalen's origins, its guiding vision, and how the Institute and its co-founder came of age together during a time of great spiritual awakening in the United States. Now 93, Mike Murphy recalls his own evolution and Esalen's with a detailed clarity that feels cinematic. His grandfather first arrived on the land by horseback. An armed Hunter S. Thompson worked the grounds as a security guard. Mike himself, a student of the religion scholar Frederick Spiegelberg, and a yogi trained at Sri Aurobindo's ashram in India, had a showdown with a drug dealer named Big Bad Bill, and later fought hard to keep cults out of Esalen. In a conversation that spans the better part of a century, Mike talks about living a life out ahead of the game and tapping into a greater consciousness that serves both the self and the world. That's actually something he said about Taylor Swift, but it also applies to how he's lived his life as an innovator, a visionary, and a true believer in helping others access the tools that will change their lives. Welcome back to Wonderstruck. So we had a small glitch with the first part of our video, so we hope you enjoy some archival images from Esalen over the years. You'll see Mike and I around the 10 minute mark. I am speaking to Mike Murphy, the founder of Esalen, a best-selling author, a visionary, and so I've heard a great Celtic storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, I mean, just uh, most people do know about Esalen to a certain extent, and some people don't know as much about it. And essentially, we know that it's a holistic center looking at human potential, that you all look take science, the fine arts, the humanities, metaphysics, spirituality, and look at it as a whole with from a holistic perspective, which is just fantastic. And I think it's even in your mission statement that says, you know, that you have like the curiosity and the daring to look at questions that often academia and seminary, religious studies places don't look at. Just also the fact of walking into Esalen and the beautiful land and the the scenery and the landscape is almost, it, well, it actually is kind of a transcendent experience. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about Esalen and the land and the baths. Well, okay, very briefly. Um, uh, it's uh, Esalen. Um, the reason we've been able to do what you just described, to be uh, uh, unbound by academia or business or government or whatever, uh, and um, is that um, when I had the dream for the place originally, and uh, okay, it was I had grown up on that land, not uh, as our kind of getaway place, but my grandfather had bought this land, uh, two miles of Big Sur coast, uh, in 1910. And there was no highway uh, uh, open uh, through that coast, that Highway 1, until 1937. And wow. it didn't get to that property until 35. They had to, the early uh, people in my family and all had to come in on horseback. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a kind of a, a wild west, the last shred. And in, in fact, when we did... Um, get underway um, in 1961 and 62, uh, we um, turned to the sheriff for help because uh, there were a lot of people camped there who didn't believe in private property. And th these were, um, uh, well, <laughs> to describe these characters, that in itself would take an hour here, but, um, um, but the sheriff refused to send his men, he says, you boys have guns? 
Uh, he was from the South. And I, we said, no, we don't have guns, although the previous caretaker, who had been Hunter S. Thompson, a thing, <laughs> came. <laughs> yeah. I heard him. He was just 21 years old. And wow. uh, he hadn't published any books yet. Uh, he was trying to be a writer. But in any case, we had that. But we said to the sheriff, um, we don't. He said, "Well, you, you boys. He was a southern guy. You boys, you get yourself some guns, because I'm not sending my men down to your bad land. <laughs> bad land. Wow. Well, anyway. Um. So we, you know, this was a blessing and a um, difficulty. Um. Uh. It. Uh, so we were born to the freedom to do what we hmm. want. We have succeeded. The property really is part of the." Um, bless well, it's the basis of the uh, blessing we have there because it has a very evocative um power over people, which uh, it still uh, is much discussed how it works. And one reason is you know, being right there, uh, on um, the property rolls along from 40 to 100 feet above the ocean, mm. right on the cliff. So you're always there's the ocean, but there are there are these high hills. You could say small mountains behind you, going up to fifteen hundred feet. So it's on you're on the front edge of a sled that's actually moving. You know, it actually is the tectonic plates are shifting, and we have this volcanic, uh, we produced water. Uh, that comes out of these cliffs. And that was why my grandfather bought the property for those that, uh, hot springs. He wanted to create a spa. He was a doctor. He had a couple of hospitals. He um, he had originally come out from uh, Tennessee in the, in the 18, early 1890s and ended up in Salinas. And um, hmm. uh, so, okay. And so he um, wanted to build a spa down on the coast and those uh, hot baths um, are there, and they are a pervasive influence. And uh, plus, those waves br breaking in, and some of the big ones come in 20 feet tall and bang against those cliffs. Wow. And you can actually sit in these hot tubs and the, uh, in a stormy day when mm -hmm. it's growing, and you're safe in a hot tub that is anchored into the cliff, and these waves come rolling in. So you're raw and exposed to the elements. And so there's a lot of theory, you know, negative ions, for example, but people get high on the land. Yeah. And uh, so that helps. And, um, you know, well-known teachers who come and lead in different workshops uh, compare the experience there to say doing it in a Hyatt house or yeah. doing it somewhere in a hotel. It just is completely different. And it also has different microclimates. Mm. So you know, one part of, you know, we'd have to spend the rest of the hour describing this, but <laughs> temperatures and so forth. <clears throat> so I like to say there's also different psychic microclimates, uh, different moods that result from these workshops. Yeah. And um, so the range, so people's range of emotion and range of conversation is for most people richer anywhere yeah. else. But we've managed, and I think we've gotten a lot better of it through the years, <clears throat> of, um, in a sense, inviting safe emergencies. Yeah. Uh, people to explore into this or that um, in an edgy way. You just couldn't get away with it in a classroom at Harvard or Stanford. I mean, you, you couldn't do it. Or in a hotel or or uh, in a church. Um, so it has that freedom, but yet um, I think we've really learned how to keep it basically safe. Yeah. Uh, in the 60s, it wasn't altogether safe. And um, it. Um, we were lucky that we, well, I uh, had to consult with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, in 64. We started in 62. But in 64, I met with the head of the DEA for Northern California. He's actually a great guy. And he lectured me on the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> and he said, now, look, um, you cannot 
go into people's rooms, searching them for whether they've got anything on them because they can sue you out of existence. You leave that to us. Mm. But what you have to do is get rid of the dealers. And yes, yeah, we do have our men occasionally patrolling. Yeah. So I had to confront the first, the famous, we had a famous dealer down there, Big Bad Bill. And it was when I won my spurs as the, <laughs> the young innkeeper when I had to tell Big Bad Bill he could never come back again. And <laughs> it was a, a kind of a showdown out of high noon, you know. He was six foot four, cut and buffed, wore a big black hat. And he was about as alpha male as alpha male can get. <laughs> so word got out that I was going to confront, that little Mikey Murphy was going to confront Big Bad Bill. So, oh my God, you know, my, my so-called friends gathered around to watch this thing. And um, Oh my. So, yeah, right in this lodge we had. You had a showdown. We had a showdown in front of 30, my, my good buddies watching with vast amusement and wonderment. Mm. And um, anyway, he came in and I, I told him, I said, Bill, I'm, uh, all is well, you know, it's all good. Uh, nobody's going to get in trouble, but I do have to tell you right now, uh, the uh, DEA is on to us and on to you. Mm -hmm. I told a lie. I I said, uh, one of them is watching us now, but I have to just tell you, Bill, uh, you can never come on this property again. Well, mm -hmm. he he tried to control himself, but I could just feel him, you know, the nostrils dilating, you look like, a, like this. And he had a little crisis, but sitting still and looking at me, this imposing character. Then he relaxed, reached out and said, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Well That's done. All. And he got up and we walked out and I was promoted in the eyes of the onlookers. <laughs> yeah. Well, very, very good success in conflict resolution, handling that super smoothly. That's anyway, so you make a point, though, Mike, about how Esalen you know, also it's like the, the land is transcendent. Being there is, is a profound experience and that you just don't need, I mean, psychedelics can be a great pathway to yeah. something, but it's only one pathway. There's right. so much more and so right. much more of what, what you all do there involves, you know, other types of research and experiences beyond the psychedelics. And it makes me come back to the original question I wanted to ask you is that you ended up even in, from what I understand, you ended up by accident in, in Sp Frederick Spiegel Spiegelberg's class at Stanford instead of your pre-med class. Like you were moving into the science and by accident or serendipity, you right. end up in this religion, comparative religion class right. by a guy, he was taught by Carl Jung, right? Well, he he was um, he, he was good friends with Jung at the Aronauts meetings in Europe. Right. And, but he was a very close friend of Paul Tillich's. Right. And, um, you know, when um, Hitler came to power in 33, um, fortunately, a few were out of the property that were targeted for immediate control of uh, uh, Einstein, Tillich, a few others. So uh, Frederick had to took, take over uh, Tillich's teaching role in um, Dresden. And luck, luckily, he got out and he, he waited too long. But anyway, in 30 seconds, he got out um, and came to America. So anyway, he he brought this rich European culture and um, he uh, had a great presence. Um, and uh, uh, I was lucky. And yes, it was by mistake. I was 19. I was a sophomore and um, pre-med and and so forth. And um, I'd heard about him. And this was the second lecture. I, I said, well, I'm going to stay here just for this lecture. And he came out and immediately quieted these restless Stanford kids, 600 of, of them, uh, because it was an auditorium. That's, that's the reason they shifted classes. And this was one of these big lecture things that he, um, he was coming in and they, okay, and um, came in and stood in front, up on a on the stage and waited for silence, which came right away. 
And then he just said one word, Brahman. Huh. <laughs> one word. And um, then he lectured on the Vedic, well, the Vedic hymns and the early Upanishads. And at the end of this lecture, in which he held us spellbound, I was, and I had been a religious kid, but in the first wave of the Stafford's stuff, I'd kind of abandoned forever the Virgin Mary and the Trinity. And um, and I'd been an altar boy in the Episcopal Church, a religious kid. But um, I had abandoned the Christian apparatus. Um, but I heard that. And then at the end of the lecture, he said one other word, Atman, which is Brahman. Well, I had to go back up to my fraternity, walking out of there, and just one sentence kept going through my head, like an obsessional thought. You'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. I was in a, uh, it was it, it was really, Elizabeth, really uh, an exaltation. Yeah. And, uh, so I quit my wow. course and stayed in this, uh, uh, thing for the spring semester of my second year there and to make a long story short that led to me dropping my pre-med I thought I was going to be a doctor and the, it was kind of a role assignment from the family basically and um, um, and um, quit the fraternity and um, shocked my family um, who you know thought as my father said to me son you know if you could have shifted to anything else except a yogi what does a yogi do did they finally did your did your dad finally think like oh wow look what you've done with esalen and look at this a human potential movement that you've created and influenced the world in this way did they finally get it or they got it even before that. I, I have to tell you, uh, what a, oh, God, my parents were incredible. My father, uh, at first, threatened to sue uh, Stan <laughs> oh, for, uh, uh, you know, ruining their son, destroying their son. And um, But after I graduated, and I was on fire, you know, I, I was lit up at that point. I was... Uh, you know, a certified religious nut at this point. I was meditating six or eight hours a day. Uh, I was on fire. And, uh, but in any case, um, uh, I was, um, uh, had to be in the army. <clears throat> and just so I was in the Korean War. Um, and a big check came in the mail. I was stationed uh, for heroic duty in Puerto Rico in the great war of the mosquitoes down there, but um, it, uh, um, in comes this check and it says, Mike, this is, if you decide to go to India, this will get you there. Oh. And he, and uh, my parents are fantastic. That's wonderful that they kind of turned around. I mean, it was kind of dramatic. And I'm thinking about for you, like, as you describe it, that exaltation, like you go into that class and it's, you know, Brahman and then Atman and you walk out you walk out changed. Right. You know? And then you're going to India at some point, and then you're founding Esalen. And I think about that again, going back to the psychedelics, you know, from when I was reading um, Jeff Prypal's book, The History of Esalen, I understand that, you know, in your life, you've had, a, you know, you've had a psychedelic experience or tried, tried it only six or seven times. And so that's not that many, you know, relatively speaking. And so I was just curious if you would maybe tell us you know, why so little, or maybe that seems like a lot, I don't know. Um, and then I also understand that um, Aldous Huxley and his wife, Laura, guided you. Right. And I guess your first or second experience. So it's like, I just wonder if there's something fascinating to hear about that. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, well, these are uh, great questions for me. I, um, um, well, when I lit up as a 19 year old and, um, it um it came uh even in in the, that first course uh in the spring of 1950 um um with an introduction to a wide range of metaphysical framings mm. by Spiegelberg who was steeped in this and he knew 
Okay, and uh, I learned about Sri Aurobindo, the Indian philosopher, uh, who whose mystical vision was based on the idea, it's an ancient idea, that the entire cosmos is emanated from the divine and uh, into in, what he called the inconscient, into matter, and in the course of time is manifesting its implicit divinity that's the basis mm. of yearning we secretly all have to go further with our lives. Uh, and that yearning gets refracted through this immense prism of the evolutionary process itself and then through the culture we inhabit and through our schooling and through our family. And it's always pressing to be born in us. Uh, and so uh, the task mm. Of the Arbindo Yoga was to broker that and bring it into existence. That's the guiding idea for me uh, to start Esalen. Yeah. That's why I wanted to do it. And then to find all these companions, comrades, pressing in the same direction. So we became a rallying place. This was in the early 60s. Yeah. And at first, it was um, um, basically pro lecture programs for a couple of years. But it, we had quite an all-star cast. And when we started, we had a kind of vertical takeoff. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, half the leaders were famous. Yeah. So, um, we have never lacked for people wanting to be at Esalen. And it's not that big a place. I mean, now we've reduced... Uh, the number of people on the property because it got to be like Coney Island. I mean, it, it pretty soon you had, oh my God, people were all over the place and we had to get it under control, learn how to manage it, bring it uh, to where it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, better managed than ever now. We've gotten more professional, but we've remained open and free and nobody's captured the flag. This is what we uh, said. Yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. Tell, explain what you mean by nobody's captured the flag, because that's a great, that's a great philosophy. Well, uh, this was uh, when Dick Price and I made common cause. Um, my grandmother first said, we can never give this property to Michael because he will immediately <laughs> Hindus, immediately. <laughs> when I came to her in 1958 or 59, I was 27, 28 by then and been to India, living in India. And, um, but then through, um, you know, there's been a lot written about this and uh, Jeff Kripal's book describes it. Well, we had a kind of breach birth, you know, with gunfire and everything, and Hunter Thompson. Up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he helped give birth to this whole thing <laughs> through the trouble. He was, oh God, what a thing. So, okay. So um, that um, um, came um, with a lot of excitement and more psychedelics than we realize. But now, you mean I, like that nobody captures the flag? Is that like... I had been vaccinated against cult yeah. quite, before this started. First, while I was at Stanford, uh, a, a group of us students formed in my junior and senior years. And it around a very charismatic graduate student and you know when you're raw to the world in a university like that there are more than a few charismatic graduate students forming circles mm. i don't care what university it's at it's it's across nobody's written yet a great history hmm. of this but um all right so that was uh, um fortunately i ducked out of that it became a cult i mean mm. uh, there were originally about nine in it, then it got on to four or five. So that was a mini cult. But then later, a few years later, when I went to live in India at the at the ashram of Sri Aurobindo, uh, a really elite um, group of uh, people who uh, were in the sadhana, about 1,500, with servants, 
who, you know, you would be meditating and a servant would be cleaning your room while you meditated. So it was an upper class cult. And it under this the flag, Arbindo had died, and his great co-worker, um, the mother, um, uh, Mira Alfasa, she was from Europe, French, Jewish, uh, came up, well, a very um, compelling person. And the life there was fantastic. I mean, um, but the dogmas were reinforced and everybody recited Aurobindo by memory. And it was like the Episcopal Church all over again for me. Yeah. And when I uh, would deviate um, in any way, uh, I could feel it. And um, then that really alerted me um, to this tendency of mystical practice or any kind of religious aspiration. Mm. Constellate a group of companions who solidify and it's kind of like a super saturated solution. You know, <clears throat> you tap it on the jar when, you know, in, in, software, in high school chemistry and then it crystallizes. The crystallization of attitude, of ethic, of, and then you can tell how people stand. There's a way to stand. I, I love these anthropologists who study, you know, Pierre Bordeaux, who, you know, how French uh, working class men will not eat fish huh. because of their feet to put it on your lips and chew like that. A man shouldn't. A man oh. eats beef and not a fish. And okay, so we pick up a thousand habits mm. and it just calls this happens. Yeah. And that, shapes consciousness yes mind and body yes. mirror each other all the yes. time yes okay dick had his own vaccination against cults. so when we started that little did i know that how relentless some of the teachers that we had would try to enforce their whole system fritz pearls who invented mm. your therapy um, he really wanted, as he said, I want, I've always had this dream of having a big Jewish kibbutz, a big gestalt kibbutz. Uh -huh. <laughs> In Israel, and he, all right, and he um, was very intent huh. of uh, weaning me away from what he called the mystical and the occult. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, huh. yeah. And he would send his minions around and et cetera. So Dick and I huh. had to work at it. It's not enough to say we want an open system. You have to watch how this, the Rajneeshis, for example, started to come to Esalen pretty soon. It was a real attempt. Wow. To um, so, huh. it, so we have succeeded, you know, but it, it it's, uh, you have to be vigilant. So anyway, mm. that idea um and um just finishing back to psychedelics you asked me about that um uh, uh, but in the in in those years between the, that class at stanford i was 20 and starting s when i was 30 in those 10 years i had really based my um daily practice in, in meditation mm. uh, meditation um can come uh, in different with different varieties and so forth. So I say, speaking broadly, I had I was into it and it lit me up, and it came to me naturally. It just it did. I'd been a religious kid in high school, you know, an altar boy for the Episcopal Church, but mm -hmm. it, it, now it was meditation, but et cetera. But I was um, all right. Now came psychedelics, and in the first year of our programs. Um, I had had one session with peyote buttons alone, uh, which hit me sideways and whoa, huh. uh, experiences I had never had with meditation. But then the second one was with Aldous Huxley and Laura Huxley. So yeah. Laura uh, sat with me for six, seven hours and um, 
uh, oldest at this point, this is 1962, um, got his psychedelics right from Sandoz. And he had written The Doors of Perception. Yeah. Um, his um, He uh, had influenced the language I used in the early brochures because if I had quoted Aurobindo too much or Hegel or Fichte, or, I mean, nobody would have come. I mean, for that <laughs> beautiful English that he wrote. And um, so he had been an uh, influence. And um, that trip... Um, was interesting. Um, okay, and then I had uh, six more. I had eight trips between then and '66. Huh. I have to say, Elizabeth, really, each one was worse than the preceding. Fascinating, huh? Got worse, and I could tell it's not my ally. This is yeah. not my ally, and um, so I quit. Okay. So as it was cresting at Esalen, I was shrinking from it. Mm. We were opposite directions. So um, um, finally, um, at Esalen, along with the culture generally, it regurgitated this. It, uh, it, it, it's, we overdosed. It was a drunken mysticism. Yeah. We're very capable of getting drunk on almost anything, right? Amen. Amen. And um, that's songs of innocence and songs of experience, you know, William Blake. I mean, we, yeah. as, uh, has gone through different stages. And um, it still is. And the demographic, Esalen's demographic, uh, which worldwide has not yet, I believe, been adequately described by any sociologist, cultural anthropologist, or uh, historian. Mm. It's a river. It's like an atmospheric river mm. flowing in the sky. Well, um, this is a cultural river flowing through the world towards this secret, it, it, to this greater life that's pressing to be born in us. Everything that you're touching upon follows kind of the trajectory of what I want to ask you about, like starting from the physical body into like the greater consciousness, you know, and everything in between and to a certain extent. And, you know, I, I just, you know, like, like, I think it's, it's all there. And what I mean by that is just starting with, you know, people probably, well, some people probably do not know that you wrote the definitive book on golf in 1971, <laughs> you know, like everybody, like people that play golf know this book. And it <laughs> seems kind of, when I first heard about it, I was like, wait, what? And then I read, it's like, you, you talk about how the soul the actual yeah. soul is reflected in the swing of the golf the golf swing. And I was like, that's fascinating. That's like yoga. And then it goes into the whole subtle body aspect with like the theosophist doing like these exercises to activate consciousness and the soul. And anyway, I, so you got to start there, right? Well, Elizabeth, thank you for bringing it up. I mean, yeah, that's the first book I ever wrote. And um, uh, it, it's the luckiest thing I've ever done. I had no <laughs> idea that it would trigger what it says, 52 years. It's in nine languages. It, um, uh, If I go out to a golf course and the word gets out that I'm there, someone is going to come in and confess their latest mystical experience on a golf course. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay, you got you got to tell us one of them. Give us a good, good golf mystical experience. The experiences range widely. And um, now... Um, uh, and, and lately, more and more, first of all, there's a range of experience that uh, is very gentle and um, unobtrusive uh, that is not as dramatic as some of these experiences people will tell me that with, that are it's right out of James's varieties of religious experience. But this is a more subtle thing that happens. Hmm. And um, it's come up for me big time now in our study of subtle bodies. Uh, and that is um, a kind of natural high that golfers experience. Now, even though uh, they um, get into these great lamentations that they miss this golf shot, and it's fiendishly clever game, and it's, it, it, it's profoundly absurd, whacking a little ball into a little hole 
a quarter of a mile away and then doing this 18 times. It takes four hours, let's say, for an average round. All right. Uh, but they come away lamenting their bad shot or bragging about this, bragging about this miracle shot or whatever. But with it all, a pervasive sense of well-being. I mean, people have it. Now, I equate it, if somebody wants to correlate it with um, psychedelics, to a, a very gentle, um, very light dose of psilocybin, mm -hmm. where you're not having uh, visions, you're not having ecstasies, but you're kind of in a glow. Mm -hmm. now, it's the easy glow. Now, my friend Richard Baker, the who's truly a creative Zen teacher, um, he says a lot of this elementary meditation is happening all the time uh, to countless people lying on beaches in the sun and just letting go to feeling good sunbathing. And yeah. a lot of what might start to happen in a meditation retreat or a golf. And um, so um, this, um, uh, anyway, it sets the stage for deeper and more dramatic disclosures. When you play golf, uh, you necessarily have a certain amount of sensory deprivation by this continual refocusing on this absurd act mm -hmm. and complex swing. I mean, we, in the Paleolithic, our Paleolithic ancestors in the hunt did not do a golf swing. Mm -hmm. If they were charged by a bear, I mean, you don't have time to tee up a ball and hit it. And... Um, so it's uh, an acquired athletic capability and mm. fiendishly challenging, I must say. This is why we, when you see a Tiger Woods hit a ball and you see it fly for 300 yards, it's just, it, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, if you're near it, it's awesome. Mm. Wonderstruck, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Natural. And I and your tendency to think it's a speciation difference when you're around these pro athletes and do things that the rest of us can't do is awesome. Yeah. So it's awesome. Uh, okay. So back to these what people are telling me. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, along with it is coming these experiences, and. Um, so anyway, anybody who's done any kind of sensory deprivation stuff, say in a flotation tank or whatever, uh, it you know it allows your unconscious material to come up. So it's not unlike it's the same. It's affiliated to let's say a psychoanal psychoanalysis on the couch, a Freudian psychoanalysis, and free association, and then a natural catharsis and whatever. Mm -hmm. and that psychology generally um, has learn this and we've dramatically explored it or since freud um and um uh, so forth uh, but uh, again you're focusing in on some setup that focuses you in a way to allow this disclosure to occur in you all right but there are different layers of human nature so not only do you see people see we people and not only get this preliminary glow, but um, we'll have, um, uh, will be taken out beyond themselves. Um, a woman told me once that um, on a, a summer afternoon, as the sun was setting, and uh, she was playing the 18th hole of her country club, she... Um, suddenly was caught in a state in which she could see the sun rising through the ground. Now, the, this is her land. The sun was rising through the ground, and I realized the sun was setting. Uh, this is one of these gorgeous California magnificent golf courses, and you can see the sun setting, but it was rising through the ground. And then she went into the clubhouse, and it was shining through the walls. And it shone through the walls of her car as she drove home. Wow. And she woke up the next morning and it was shining into her bedroom 
and she experienced something she had never experienced in her entire life, and it changed her life. So um, when I they uh, published the, the 50 year anniversary of the book, so they wanted there at um, um, the publisher uh, wanted to um, um, have a new forward or something. So I then told him, uh, I told, I, 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 I described this story in that forward to the mm -hmm. latest rendition of, of Golf of the Kingdom. Uh, because um, um, at what one point, uh, and when I saw her again, um, she asked me, is this what they mean? This is what Mark Zuckerberg means by the metaverse? And I, and I thought, um, and she said, um, what do you think? What would Shiva's Iron say, the protagonist? Oh, right, so, in your book. Well, Shiva's Iron, so I, I imagined this, and it was this publisher, a lovely guy. He said, listen, you, oh, uh, nail that one, because it's up for people now. What's the role of technology and the hmm. metaverse and the internet and now AI and et cetera? So um, anyway, I, I described what he would say. You yeah. know, it's an absurdity. And of course, this is a, a lady who had never studied William James or Plotinus or Meister Eckhart or the great mystics of antiquity. But her description was at, of the highest order of realization. Right. There are a lot of words in Sanskrit for this. Um, when um, uh, 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 Spiegelberg conveyed hints of this when he stood up on that, when I was a kid, I said, Brahma, yeah. which is Atma, our deepest subjectivity. We are secretly that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So she was untutored metaphysically. So all these golfers, totally untutored, they've never been in a comparative study, a religion course. It's the mysticism of everyday life, which is abroad in the culture. It's everywhere, and but it's not named. We live... We fly under strange flags, so it's it 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 has converged with you know uh, all the Eslin aspiration and to say that um, this is abroad, this is us. We are wired for this, right? But yeah, all, it all, makes me it makes me think of how many people because that book is such a success and a bestseller, how many people that book on golf has reached that would not be reading William James or Plotinus or any of these kinds of mystical things, like you said, with this woman who saw this glow, this incredibly life-changing experience. Yes. So what a gift to her or to and to others that have a book on golf that's like anchoring it into yeah. something that we don't talk about. Right. Uh, well, I, uh, Elizabeth, that's well said. I appreciate that a lot. I mean, exactly. I mean, um, did, did you ever read John Carr's history? I, of, I did talked, not. Yeah. I mean, anyway, he um, he has um, oh God, he was wonderful. He he was into this, hmm. and uh, there's a book, uh, Victory at the Breakfast at the Victory. The Victory was the name of a a little stand is somewhere in Manhattan, maybe Brooklyn. Um, mm. and, um, it's the mysticism of everyday life. It breaks mm. out mm -hmm. in, uh, in ways that, um, well, anyway, that's a lot of people uh, don't really get from their religious, from Sunday school. I mean, they, right. and that's where, why the people at Esalen are, are a lot of them. It's kind of like, um, Part of a cosmic jailbreak. I mean, breaking yeah. breaking out of the strictures to come to this magnificent. Yeah. Uh, in in a way, we're we're all having to be brought out of the closet. Yes, you know, absolutely. Mystic, uh, our mystic closet. You know, and, this makes me think of um, our common friend Simon Cox, who <laughs> he was telling me a story that you had shared with him. Um, about the the weirdness bell curve, you know, 
And it's like this, this idea that, you know, as you were saying, right, this is a human capacity. We are, we are ourselves and we're beyond ourselves. And he- he- most of the time we don't know it because you don't get it in Sunday school. And that people have this capacity to, to get it, you know, like on a certain level, we get it, we get it, we get it. Then we hit here and it gets way too weird. And it's like, okay, shutting the door on the closet, no more. But that's right. why, like what you've done with Esselin is opening this door and the book on golf and the future body and the study of the subtle body. It's fantastic. Uh, Mike, do, do you think, what do you think like this opening of the door, you know, it goes back to doors of perception, but opening the door to this can do for us as a, as a, as humanity, as a globe, as a world civilization, as with all the divisiveness and everything else, like, how do you see the future aided by this? All right, you've got the right question. How? Yeah. You know, um, Fritz Perls, God bless him. I mean, you know, he he did, uh, he, he could be a bully, but he did have, <laughs> he had a clinical genius. I mean, to look at people, and he wasn't always nice on how he informed those people about such and such they were doing, and they weren't ready for it. But anyway, he uh, agreed with the, with the Buddha, who would not do metaphysics. And uh, all the Buddha was interested in is how. How do we achieve this nirvana, or whatever you want to, however you want to frame it? We have to find ways to work our way out of these political jams, et cetera, et cetera. This is the game of all games. Yeah. It's the cosmic game. How to grow into this greater life that's within us. Yeah. We glimpse. And some people pursue. Yeah. Obviously, they come to Esalen. They're pursuing it. And um, how? So if that, 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 you know, we don't have much time left here today, but there are lots of different hows, and they're, now that's been a great change, uh, and this is part of this change in the demographic, which I don't think has been fully uh, embraced yet by mainstream sociology and cultural anthropology. Um, the, the invention r- rate has gone way up for the ways and means. Of practice and um, it's not been uh, now the Gallup poll and other polls um, have been right to say that more and more people will say that they're spiritual but not religious so that's something it gives a headline uh, there are many uh, studies uh, that I would say have made a preliminary advance into seeing it in the culture but okay so, um, you know, never, uh, believe me, no football teams that I ever heard of uh, won a national championship with their quarterback, particularly Michigan, which has won more football games than any other college. It's interesting. And um, I didn't, I hadn't known that. Now it's all uh, broadcast because of their national championship. But um, hmm. the, the, um, to have the quarterback, you know, kind of when I went to high school, uh, boy, the, the the girls flocked to the quarterback first. Uh, they, they tend to be good looking and tall and glamorous in high schools across America. And then they get to college. Oh, my God, the quarterback. And, um, you know, doing becoming a yogi. Yeah. And me to be a yogi. I was a kind of a star in school, you know, for and so my. Were father, you a quarterback? No, I, I'm not a football star. I, I was a good athlete, but um, the, uh, the, well, anyway, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't, it wouldn't have been big enough. And, um, and, never, and also the, the quarterbacks just were bigger and better looking. And uh, the girls, I'm just trailing after them. And um, I'm, you know, I'm embellishing this a little, but, um, but for that guy, um to be demonstrating this yoga position in the out on the edge of the field before the game with his shoes off. I mean, it's it was a what was he's trying to tell us something. He's yeah. standing for this. Well, all I'm saying is this uh-huh. stuff is spreading in these strange ways. 
And um, I predict that um, some great books are going to appear that, that dramatize uh, this emergent something. Because I, I really did want to ask you, I know that um, Esalen had this, you know, that you've got the, you know, the future of the body book in which when I was reading it, you talk about, you study extraordinary experiences, you know, kind of near death experiences and like astral body and astral travel and all these things. And you said in your book, you ask yourself, like, what does this mean? Does this, does this change my belief in God or something beyond? And you said in 1992, you were agnostic. So I wanted to know since then, and since you had the, like the Sursums at Esalen, yeah. what's changed for you? If, if it has, are you still agnostic? Now, when I said agnostic, uh, that I was agnostic about what's going on first with reincarnation and with survival. Yeah. I am not agnostic about Brahman and Atman and Brahman. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. That helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, um, I um so um and I feel that's I wanted Esalen to be part of the embrace of this implicit divinity on the one hand, but not locked into the dogmas that have associated the, the religious. The religion yes. where I don't want to relitigate that which we know. Yes. Know that these this greater consciousness is available. And why relitigate it again and again and again? And for me, you don't need to relitigate um telepathy, clairvoyance. Now, a lot of these psychic powers to me are facts. So I want to um help midwife the cutting edge yeah. of as yet not fully understood demographic. Uh, there are a lot of people around like you and me who enough already, who, uh, oh God, if we have to do one more experiment with telepathy, I want to puke. I mean, we've done a 10,000 already. I mean, there's it's a fact. It's not repeatable like uh, this or that. Yeah. But how much that all of us who are just common sense, sensible people know that's uh, unrepeatable, but we know it as a fact. I feel like people would be very interested in what your daily practice is because, I mean, you know, if, if I can, if I, am I allowed to, am I allowed to tell people what your age is or do you want to tell people, the basic, can I say what your age is? Uh, which? You're how old you are? 93. Yeah. So the question is, why do you look 39 instead of 93? Or you still look like the high school quarterback. I mean, like, what are you doing? Well, listen, What's I, going on over there? Well, listen, you've made my day with that 39 number. See, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'll take whatever number I can get. I've never gotten a 39 before. But, um, <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, in terms of um, uh, a lot of it, uh, seriously, Elizabeth, is that uh, is genes. You know, I have uh, there are a lot of long lived folks, and um, I say I have enough good habits. Hmm. Many. Hmm. You got to be careful, not too many, because I I do have friends who their good habits shortened their life, and uh, but it's all right. There's been a lot of experimentation, you know, with everything. But I, uh, you know, for example, no matter what you ask me, I mean what I eat, um, I do have, I have found my way to what works for me. On well, do you, do you, what's your routine like? I mean, do you wake up and meditate? Do you take long walks? Okay. <laughs> Broccoli? <laughs> it's in my 20s. Uh, and I was a certified nutcase. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was, I was sitting six to eight hours a day. Yeah. And I did, I did that, and even in the army, um, you know, in the army, um, um, well, I maybe, maybe I worked half an hour a day. If you ever wrote the, you know, that great book, um, what's oh god about um, the, the army in World War Two, uh, James Heller's book. Um, anyway, um, hmm. so anyway, what did I do? Uh, I was meditating and reading, hmm. and. Uh, I would get up before Reveille, and uh, Reveille would blow at 
six, but I would get up about five and go meditate in the chapel. So, all right, so that, and then the ashram and everything. But once Esalen started, and I had been a virgin, I was a virgin until I was 32 years yeah. old. All right. So with Esalen, um, you could say on that front, I melted down. And mm -hmm. it was um, a delayed adolescence, uh, certainly. It was um, uh, whatever. So I, to make a, it a, a simple way to say it, from being a jnana yogi, which um, in India is the way of meditation, and with the uh, broad family of meditation practices, not only emptying the mind, but opening to that light that the lady saw Van Gogh. That uh, there's a, uh, several basic primal movements of transformative yoga, transformative practice. Mm. I was full time until Esalen started. Then it shifted, and what I told myself that I was becoming a karma yogi through works, and. Um, so uh, I have looked for ways, let's say when I wrote Golf in the Kingdom, it was truly channeled in many ways. It's amazing. When I look back, um, my, um, our family favored writing my grandmother. Oh, my God, she re rewarded the writers. My brother had a great success with a novel. And my grandfather delivered John Steinbeck. And so Steinbeck and my... Wow. My father were bu uh, buddies growing up together wow. east of eden you know there's a dr murphy and so okay and then wow. became my brother's cool. yeah, same agent same so okay so that was much in the air mm -hmm. all right now i i was 39 when i sat down to write my brother had already written a best-selling novel when he's 23 okay so Good uh, lord so, okay so how to turn an activity that becomes your primary focus into a kind of channeling. Yeah. Now, basically, I had made that move <laughs> as I started Esalen. And I um, and I started to keep a journal of coincidences or synchronicities. Uh, Jung had quite an idea there, that synchronicity. There's something to it. Yeah. Okay. How to... Um, so that became more and more my yoga. Now, I continue mm -hmm. to meditate. I I do not meditate now in that way I did then, where I sit down and focus for an hour at a time. I don't do that anymore. But I recollect, I would say, every single hour of the day. But that when it has morphed into a kind of recollection, I can do it right now. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so it's become second nature. Interesting. Um, somebody who was actually good at this was uh, Gurdjieff and Uspensky. They uh, yes. Was you know the the older I get, the more I appreciate those guys. At first, mm -hmm. I thought, oh God, I, that that's too much because there are all these Gurdjieff groups, and some of them are real cults. But nevertheless, he he it was the mysticism of everyday life. The Gurdjieff yeah. and Uspensky. Okay. That recollection, that natural morphing of formal meditation into mindfulness. Now that yeah. has gone abroad in the culture. It's now often misused. I mean, it's um, been made so extraordinarily vanilla that it's almost washed out all its meaning. But uh, it's but it's right too. The the morphability of these profound practices. Um, I mean, you could, right now, I, it's become a, a conversation item with my friends explaining who and what is Taylor Swift. <laughs> what is this phenomenon? I had actually never heard of her until <laughs> six. So I'd never, I had no idea that she'd been a known for 14 years and since she was 16 or whatever. And um, so anyway, it's become a, and it's very much like my apprehension of the golf world. What goes on? And then the morphing of, let's say, what happens when she fills these stadiums. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's interesting. And then how it takes projections. The New York Times last Sunday had a big thing that she is uh, she is a uh, queer coded. She's telling the world she's queer. Oh, this is uh, in, a, in one way it's an outrageous critique. But um, it raises the issue, how come, and you know, in the early days when she, she uh, the eras to her, these are the eras of her life. Mm -hmm. The Swifties have come along with her. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's another example of how humans channel this greater life. Mm. And uh, um, well, anyway, mm -hmm. Dave Morin, who... Um, is is quite. I call him Gandalf. He's the chairman of our board of Esalen. He's forty three, had this huge success in the valley, and still does. And he and his wife, uh, she also is very successful, and extraordinary lady. Um, uh, they love Taylor Swift, but he sees in her something a lot different, and how people project into her. And so, the the author more or less confessed. At the end, of, there's a big spread in the in the New York Times opinion section of the South Sunday. Um, at one level, absolutely outrageous because you know seeing yourself in someone and saying that what she's really doing is trying to tell the world it's that she's queer. Well, I I just I find that extremely hard to believe. <laughs> I I just do. Uh, but what's more interesting. It's how she is living a life out ahead of her game plan. Because she's obviously an aided probably by her father, who's a Merrill Lynch broker. She's good in business. She seems to be good at everything. She's just 34 now. She writes these songs, and you watch her. Uh, okay, now I have to say I've developed an eye for somebody who... Um, let's lack of a better word, channeling, being possessed by whatever it is that's working. And you can give yeah. it a Jungian names, like, you know, you're owning an archetype, or you can, there are many ways contemporary people are trying to name this emergence of this greater life. Mm. It goes on in these gatherings and the, where they have the bracelets. I, who had this idea of, and they signaling one another. So you have 70,000 people recently here in, down near us here uh, on the peninsula. <clears throat> um, this, this um, it's in our poor, impoverished public culture of America with all its divisions and all its craziness and all that's wrong, finds ways to live into what these great moments in history. I can yeah. imagine, let's say, <clears throat> in the Greeks, so Sophocles, um, what Aristotle's catharsis, I mean, it's, what was going on there? Okay, hmm. we are out ahead of our understanding. Yes. yes. Guys on the golf course want to tell me these stories. They've never read William James. They've never ever studied yoga. They've never... Nothing. And they're having these authentic experiences. So with her. Now, so, okay. Um, now, see, I digressed here. Well, but I was thinking it's about you, too. I mean, you're talking about how you end up channeling it and embodying it yourself. All right. Well, see, that's it. That's, I would say, at the heart of what I'm doing now is um, asking how best to serve now in relation to Esalen. And then, uh, okay, so this yoga for me now, yeah. really, I have to say it, and I say this around down there, who's writing the script yeah. for this place? This place, this demographic is out ahead because we do a lot of, well, the staff there thinking a lot about how to program, who yeah. to invite, who not to invite. And so the group, um, uh, and this is under a new regime over the last couple of years with a new CEO who's doing extremely well. Um, um, I, I want to stand back and then channel it through them. 
So this is me going from um, a meditator, although I meditate, I still do. And this recollection is a constant in my life. Yeah. It's as common to me as breathing. Yeah. But so it, it's alive. Um, and I've tried all sorts of sports stuff and everything. And um, so now I've it's very simplified. And um, so here's the, now this is getting real confessional here, but um, all right. So this group, we started Integral Transformative Practice. Um, as, uh, George Leonard was really the primary architect and invented a kata. You know, that's a series of exercises in the martial arts or, you know, Chinese yoga, uh, a series of, and you've seen them practicing these different movements and kata. So I don't do the kata, but making my bed, I make into a kata. So all these different movements, if you do it thoughtfully and enjoy it. Mm. It only takes four minutes, it's a complicated bed. So anyway, four minutes, but all right, if you do it mindfully with your attention, mm. letting the pleasure of it, uh, letting it morph from work yeah. to Now, how many people in the kitchen, how many women who are um, who are having to do most of the cooking get into this? And um, I yeah. used, my mother, uh, her side of the family, which are, are Basque, French Basque from the Pyrenees. They cooked lights out, just unbelievable. And how did she do it? And all of this, that is that was for her a yoga. Yeah. And little town where we lived, Salinas, um, the other women would love to get her recipes. And then they try and they couldn't bring out the effects she could bring out. And I, that's when I learned about a craft transcends recipes. Yes, it's, yes, yes, yes. Very much so. It's so like it's, it seems like you're saying you're channeling it in a way that it just becomes alive within you, that it just becomes your, it's your life. It's not yeah. a practice that's separate. You are it. Right, exactly. And so I, if you uh, map me through the day, I'm not the uh, a formal looking yogi like I was in my mm -hmm. 20s. Wow, I'd have to say I get wonderstruck to different degrees. You know, little ones, uh, let's say, um, um, well, um, recently, I mean, I can go back and, well, if, if, you, if you give me a whenever, I, then I can think of all sorts of moments where... Whenever, yeah, whenever. Whenever. Um, Okay, a dramatic one, um, where I was, um, it overcame me physically, was um, I was sitting at the back of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Mm. And I had walked in, not knowing that they were going to have an extremely high mass, led by a cardinal of the church. So I, somehow I, I got my way in there, and... Um, Behind me was the big organ at the back, and then there's the organ up front. So they could play these. This, I'm dying to get to the new. They've redone the cathedral there at Notre Dame. Yeah. And, all right. And so I sat down. And out of the darkness, a hundred and some feet up in the darkness, slowly was coming down the red hat of a cardinal on a some sort of little cable being lowered while the cathedral fell into silence, and then the organs hit it big. And I started to shake uh, where I couldn't control it. I mean, my knees and everything. And then this procession, I think there were 10 bishops and about 20 ministers, and then it came through, but it was below me. So I was looking down and the front, and for an hour, I couldn't stop shaking. My knees were shaking. I mean, it was just, huh. um, that was an assault that was cellular all the way down. But, yeah. you know, meditator, I could hold it. And then, um, and in those moments, I've had to learn that 
uh, you have to grow in capacity to hold these very powerful disclosures. Yes, yes. The reason I think a lot of these golfers do it is they work into it so gently. And yeah. you're surrounded in the world's largest gardens, these 200-acre gorgeous golf courses, the beautiful ones. Well, there in oh. that cathedral, um, uh, so that, that would be... Um, uh, to close my eyes, I could uh, get into the realm of my very deepest knowing. Mm. No, and this is not believing. Yes. This is knowing and seeing and being in uh, some of the higher reaches of the divine nature that are in us all. That's a great last line. I like that. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to be with you, really. Yeah, thank you. That was Mike Murphy. Thank you so much, Mike. To learn more about Mike's work, check out www.eslin.org. Please come back next time on Wonderstruck. I'll be talking with Nicole Baden Tatsuru Roshi about her life in Zen. For more information about Wonderstruck, our guests, and our events, check out wonderstruck.org. And please follow the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. We really want to hear from you with your feedback, reviews, and ratings. You can also follow us on Instagram, X, TikTok, and Facebook at Wonderstruck Pod. Wonderstruck is produced by Wonderstruck Productions along with the teams at Bailey Newman and Freetime Media. Special thanks to Brian O'Kelly, Eliana Elefthiru, and Travis Reese. Thank you for listening. And remember, be open to the wonder in your own life. <laughs>